Welcome to our program today, part of the Middle East Policy Forum of the Institute for Middle East Studies and the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University here in Washington, DC. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, we note with appreciation the generous support that we get from the ExxonMobil Foundation for our forum. For those of you of the Islamic faith, uh, Ramadan Kareem. Format for today's program. We'll begin with a lecture followed by an opportunity for questions. If you have a question that you'd like to pose, uh, submit that question in the chat box and we will get to them uh, during the last part of our program today. So today's event uh, is the annual Kuwait Chair Lecture, which I as the Kuwait Professor for Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Affairs I have been presenting each year since 2007. I haven't ever done it this way. For those of you who have attended these lectures in previous years in person, and you're loyalists, and I thank you. This format actually has given us an opportunity to include uh, friends and, and interested parties all across the United States and several in foreign countries. So there are advantages and of course disadvantages. I miss being able to see you uh, as I normally would uh, during my lectures. So without further ado, um, let's begin. The topic that I chose for today is the new security environment in the Persian Gulf. Be honest, that uh, title could well be the title of lectures for years to come. The one certainty in the Gulf is change. In the past year, is a dramatic example of developments that impact on the Gulf security environment. Just think, the change in administrations in Washington, attacks on Persian Gulf shipping and on important oil installations in Saudi Arabia, ongoing attacks by Iranian supported militia in Iraq on the US embassy and US forces, and renewed talk of the US re-engaging in the joint comprehensive plan of action or the so-called uh, agreement with Iran, nuclear agreement with Iran. Then add to this, the tensions between Washington and Riyadh and the intensification of the Israeli-Iranian confrontation, which was vividly demonstrated in events just in the last uh, 48 to 72 hours. In the face of these developments, it's important to remember why the Persian Gulf remains important important to US interests. Over 60% of the world's proven oil reserves and about 40% of the world's proven natural gas reserves are in countries bordering the Persian Gulf. The United States policy for decades has been to ensure the free flow of that oil and gas to world markets, vital to a stable international economic order. Concurrently, US policy, at least since 1979, has been to ensure that the region was not dominated by a hostile power and also to support our allies in the region, both militarily and diplomatically. I think the Gulf's importance is underscored by the continuing United States military presence in the region. Now, I apologize from the outset about the slide. There are two errors on this one. This is the most recent slide that we could come up with from unclassified sources. Uh, the figure in Iraq is wrong. It should be about 2,500 today. And that in Afghanistan is roughly the same between two and a half and three and a half thousand. But the other figures are accurate. So what you see demonstrated here, however, is the breadth of our engagement militarily uh, in the region. The United States Fifth Fleet is home based in Bahrain where the US Navy has been since the late 40s. The major regional command hub for the US Central Command is in the state of Qatar. The US Third Army's regional deployment is in Kuwait. As I mentioned, we still have two and a half thousand troops in Iraq with a small number in Northeast um, Syria. Now, while the United States does not have significant forces uh, in Saudi Arabia, the kingdom is a linchpin in the security structure of the region. 
So I think perhaps no single event during this past year has had a more significant impact on the security environment in the Persian Gulf than the US elections in November. Arab Gulf states, and I must say Iran as well, immediately began assessing what the end of the Trump administration and the arrival of President Biden in the White House meant for them. All perceived that President Trump was a strong personality, important to have as a friend, that's our Arab allies, of course. But they also understood that he was a mercurial individual who could turn on the closest friend with from any perceived slight. So Gulf leaders then calculated constantly how best to maintain the best possible relationship with the president and avoid offending him. Trump himself and his close advisors, and that was primarily his family, drove the relationships in the region. This was no more apparent than in the administration's relationship with Saudi Arabia and it's especially close ties with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman that you see in this picture. Illustrative was the famous remark by the president that quote, I saved his ass, close quote, referring to charges that MBS, the Crown Prince, was behind the assassination of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Human rights issues were not on the president's agenda major arms sales were. Recall perhaps the famous picture of MBS with the president in the Oval Office, and the president was holding a sign with all the arms sales that he anticipated, highlighting the multi-million dollars of those sales we're gonna to bring to the United States. Now, the Saudi government and others in the region were quite happy that human rights uh, was not going to be a relationship with the Trump Washington as it had been under Obama. But I would say that the quixotic actions of the administration really created uncertainty over the reliability of the United States to maintain its security role in the Persian Gulf. The surprise announcement that the US was withdrawing all forces from Syria followed quickly by a decision that some would stay. That's a case in point. In truth, concern about our reliability had roots in several actions from the Obama administration. So let's not pin it just on President Trump because Gulf leaders certainly did not understand the US failure to support their and our good ally, President Mubarak, when the Arab Spring swept through Egypt. And then there was the Obama red line in Syria that we would use military force if the Syrian government used chemical weapons. They used them and we did not act. And then too, there was the Obama decision to withdraw US forces from Iraq, which I Arab Gulf allies saw as simply handing Iraq over to the Iranians. But I would also note that the Biden administration sparks a similar uncertainty with its stated determination to negotiate with Iran. The Arab Gulf states have always been wary of US efforts in that regard. But if there was one policy of the Trump administration that enjoyed wide, widespread support in the Arab Gulf states, it was certainly President Trump's determination to confront Iran. Most, but not all the governments in the Gulf applauded the US decision to withdraw from the Iran deal, the JCPOA. So you can imagine how Gulf governments react when they now hear how eager the Biden administration is to rejoin the deal. Gulf leaders are also concerned with how the US Gulf relationship is subject to domestic political pressures in the United States. They see concerted efforts in Congress to curtail arms sales and to hold regional states accountable for human rights violations. And the Biden team also made clear that human rights were going to be a factor in our relationships. And nowhere was as likely to cause more dismay than in Saudi Arabia. The Biden administration's decision to declassify an intelligence report indicating that it was highly likely that the Saudi Crown Prince 
had been behind the Khashoggi assassination is a case in point. Attentive to congressional actions and concerns, the Biden administration announced almost immediately after inauguration that there would be a comprehensive review of all arms sales to the Gulf states. And that includes a Trump decision in the last weeks of his administration to sell the newest US jet fighter, the F-35s to the United Arab Emirates. Now, let me just note that, however, that these developments do not presage a major shift in US relations with the Gulf. The new administration made it clear that it supports the security of Saudi Arabia and our other Gulf allies. Biden's foreign policy team further committed to consult closely with those countries as we begin our negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program. On human rights, we actually see some of the Gulf states responding to the targeted US criticism. And certainly on the Palestinian question, the Gulf states see as very positive the Biden's public commitment to a two-state solution and its determination to re-engage with Palestinians. But in general, I can tell you that uncertainty about the US position in the Gulf remains a looming factor in our relations with those countries. And then we have the Abram Accords, a second development that was, a, was dramatic. And it came with a joint statement on August 13th of 2020, a statement that the US, uh, UAE, sorry, and Israel were establishing diplomatic relations. The statement was groundbreaking. The first Arab normalization of relations with Israel since Egypt in 1979 and Jordan in 1994. A similar announcement from Bahrain soon followed. There was considerable expectation that other countries in the region would follow suit. Sudan and Morocco did so, but speculation that Saudi Arabia would soon follow did not materialize. There was, however, a meeting, and this is important to note, a meeting between Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Saudi Crown Prince in Saudi Arabia. Supposedly secret, but of course it came out in public. Now, the Trump administration deserves considerable praise for their engagement in facilitating normalization. But the UAE and Bahrain had their own interest in pursuing this diplomatic breakthrough. The UAE saw important economic opportunities in opening relations with Israel. There are daily reports of commercial ventures and joint collaborative efforts in energy, technology, and healthcare. And more importantly, Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain share a common concern over Iran. Now, there was certainly knowledge of earlier meetings between Israeli and UAE officials. And that led to speculation even then that Iranian actions had given Gulf countries an incentive to coordinate their positions with Israel. Now, we don't really know the full extent of Arab-Israeli cooperation against Iran. But personally, I think it's far less than much of the public speculation. Nevertheless, Iran must now consider just how these new relationships might threaten their security and for both Bahrain and the UAE, it certainly does not hurt to have Iran think that they now have security arrangements with the Israelis. And that brings us to the Iran factor. Iran is central uh, to the new security environment in the Persian Gulf. While the United States is primarily focused on the future of the Iranian nuclear program, our Gulf allies are making it clear that they are threatened by weapons that Iran is using right now. One such Iranian weapon is what some have called Iran's expeditionary actions, its use of proxies uh, in conflicts outside Iran's borders. And these actions have significantly altered the security perceptions in the Gulf. Just think back 10 years ago, it was Iran that saw itself surrounded by US forces. Thousands of US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
large naval presence in the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea, not to mention US forces in several of the Central Asian countries to the north of Iran. But today, it's Saudi Arabia that feels surrounded by Iranian-supported proxies, Iranian-backed militia in Iraq, Iranian forces in Syria, and in Lebanon, its close ties with Iranian armed Hezbollah. Iran's piece de resistance is Yemen, located on Saudi Arabia's southern flank. Iran's provision of arms, training, and money to the Houthi movement enabled that movement to solidify its dominance in the northern part of Yemen. With the drone technology also provided by Iran, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the Houthis have launched attacks on the Saudi capital, as well as oil facilities in the eastern province, among other targets. Now, Iran is an opportunistic power, and it's taken advantage of unstable situations in the region to insert itself, usually with limited resources and maximum gain. Their rather modest assistance to the Houthis led to a Saudi response that has cost millions. Now, the second area of concern to our Arab Gulf allies is Iran's missile program. Iran's research and development efforts have yielded a significant missile capability that brings all Gulf cities and economic facilities within their range. And fears of Iran's missile program are justified. In September of 2019, Several missiles struck the main Saudi petroleum facility in the eastern province, causing significant damage and a temporary loss of production. The Iranians tried initially to blame the Houthis in Yemen, but there was good evidence that the missiles had come from Iran or southern Iraq. And the attack was seen as a message to Saudi Arabia about its vulnerability to attack. The Gulf states also point out that Iran uses religion as a weapon. As the largest Shia state, Iran champions the Shia cause wherever there is a Shia population. The Sunni states of the Gulf have always believed that their Shia populations are pro-Iranian and thus are fifth columns inside the country undermining the regime's authority. In Saudi Arabia, uh, that Shia minority is primarily located in the eastern province, which is also where the major Saudi oil fields are located. In Bahrain, a Shia majority is ruled by a Sunni monarchy. And that majority has been striving for their rights ever since the Arab Spring in 2011. Now, the government of Bahrain accuses Iran of inciting these people to revolt and alleges that it has uncovered an, an Iranian effort to actually overthrow the government. Well, Iran has grown increasingly bolden over the past decade. It has attacked commercial shipping in the Persian Gulf, something not seen at this level since the 1980s during the Iraq-Iran war. In June, 2019, a ship sustained damage from a mine placed on the ship's hull Iranians denied involvement, but there's simply no other entity in the region uh, that would have undertaken such an attack. The Iranians have also seized several ships, most recently a South Korean ship, which by the way, they just released in the, in the, in the, just a few days ago. And I would just say that in the past, this kind of interference with shipping in the Gulf would have precipitated a major US response. And similarly, the attack on the Saudi oil facilities, which you can see here on the left of the slide, would have also called for a US response. In these cases, there was none. Yet, new developments calling into question US credibility as a security partner. Now, Iran's nuclear program and the JCPOA. The non-nuclear concerns of our Arab Gulf allies have had a massive impact on how the regional states perceive the Iranian nuclear issue and the JCPOA or the nuclear deal. 
That deal was signed in 2015 by the five members, permanent members of the Security Council in Germany, creating the so-called P5 plus one. And that came after two years of grueling negotiations. The JCPOA focused solely on the nuclear issue. It placed restrictions on the scope and level of Iran's enrichment activities, the capacity and location of enrichment facilities, and the size and composition of Tehran's enriched uranium stocks. It, actually something that's not often discussed, but the JCPOA indefinitely prohibited Iranian, quote, activities which would contribute to the design and development of a nuclear explosive device, close quote. To verify Iranian adherence to the terms of the JCPOA, I Iran agreed to the most robust and thorough inspection regime known to date. The International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna was charged to monitor Iranian centrifuges, Iranian uranium mills, and Iran's plant for producing heavy water. In return uh, for uh, these restrictions, Iran uh, would receive major um, sanction relief. The United States would unblock Iranian funds overseas and lift the so-called secondary sanctions that had blocked European and Asian companies from doing business with Iran. In the minds of the Arab Gulf states, the JCPOA may have dealt with the nuclear is issue, at least for a limited duration of time, but it did not address the non-nuclear uh, activities, which as I said, these states see as more direct and immediate threats to their security. Critics believe that sanction relief would simply provide Iran with additional funding for its missile program and its proxy, uh, proxy forces. Um, they also pointed to the limited time duration of several elements in the JCPOA. And many questioned whether it was actually possible, even with the inspections, to know if Iran was continuing a nuclear program in secret. Now, President Obama, uh, in a speech at the American University in Washington, responded comprehensively to critics. He acknowledged in his remarks that several troubling issues remain, but he argued that it was essential to, to curb the Iranian nuclear program. He noted that the breakout time for Iran to produce a nuclear device was extended from a few months to over a year, a time that would give the US ample time to discover whether or not Iran was violating the terms of the agreement. And President Obama stressed that diplomatic negotiations were better than war. And he highlighted the enormous international support for the JCPOA. Now we all know President Trump campaigned strongly against the JCPOA, and he vowed that if elected president, he would withdraw from the agreement. He took that action on May 8, 2018, and began his so-called maximum pressure campaign against Iran. As time passed, Iran announced incremental advances in its nuclear program leaving both the United States and Iran out of compliance with the JCPOA. I think this context is crucial to understand where we are today. President Biden has repeatedly stated the United States is willing to return to the JCPOA as has Iran, both with conditions. Both have stated that the other party must return to full compliance before they themselves will act. The US expressed a willingness to sit down with the Iranians, but they refused and insisted that other members of the JCPOA had to function as go-betweens. So today in Vienna, we see Americans and Iranians staying in separate hotels and sitting at separate tables. 
but they are discussing the many of the same issues that were central to the original JCPOA negotiations. I think despite the rhetoric, it does seem that both parties would like to return to the JCPOA or at least a modified version. There are significant obstacles to overcome, no doubt about that. On the Iranian side, one of them is the presidential elections that are, will occur in June with most observers uh, believing that hardliners are likely to capture the presidency. But on the American side, we have our own hardliners and they believe that the only approach to deal with Iran is the ma maximum pressure policy espoused by Trump. I think at this point in time, it's hard to predict the outcome of the negotiating minuet. The obstacles to a return to the JCP are formidable, but the situation is more favorable to success today than it has been at any point in time uh, since the US withdrawal in 2018. So if we take a look then at the current security environment in the Persian Gulf, let's think a little bit about what that assessment would look like. Several observations come to mind almost immediately. The first I would say is, the, is an ascendant Iran, an Iran that sees itself in a strong position vis-a-vis -vis its opponents. From this perception, Iran is unlikely to entertain negotiations over either its ballistic missile program or its expeditionary relationships with its regional proxies. I think the second observation would be that, that Arab Gulf state fears over Iran are at the highest level in years. The successful use of drones to attack Saudi cities and oil installations, the destructive missile attack on the Aramco facilities, the numerous attacks on Gulf shipping, all communicate to our allies in the region how vulnerable they are. And then, of course, there's the inter-Gulf rivalries between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, the so-called rift in the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, because that certainly undermines efforts at collective security and certainly U.S. efforts to try and build a, a, a coherent uh, opposition in the Gulf to Iran. Now, while there have been some steps public steps, I could say, indicating that there has been progress in healing that rift. I, you have to understand that the private animosities between Gulf leaders are deep and ongoing. So I anticipate we're still going to see this as a problem area. Thirdly, the third observation I would make is that, is the question of US reliability as an ally in general and as a security guarantor in particular. Questions persist among our Gulf allies as to how committed the US is to its presence in the region. While our allies have certainly sought to advance uh, their relationships with other countries such as China and Russia, I think it's quite correct to say that none of them see either of these two countries as, a, as, a, as supplanting the US as a security partner. And my fourth observation would be that while the region has changed, so has the United States. The Biden administration was, must focus on critical domestic issues. And there's certainly a desire by the American public to reduce our military entanglement in the Middle East. Globally, the Biden administration must prioritize our diplomatic and military efforts to address current global threats, such as China, climate change. So then the question is, what actions should the US take to address the current security environment in the Gulf? First and foremost, I think the US needs to deal with, its credit, with the credibility issue. That calls for close and meaningful consultations with our Gulf allies. As the Biden administration has said, there are areas of concern and there are areas of disagreement, but there are also areas of common interest. 
essential to restoring US credibility is certainly enhanced diplomacy and reaffirmations of our intentions, including our determination to maintain sufficient military capability to be able to respond to threats to their security. US red lines should be clear for our allies and for our adversaries alike for that matter. And I think then crucially important is sticking to the commitments that we make. And I'm also obviously referring to uh, past experiences that these countries have had with us. The second um, action that I think needs to be taken is clearly to pursue our reentry into the JCPOA with Iran's full compliance. Efforts ought to be made, should be made to extend the timelines in the original agreement because some of them uh, have only a couple of years left. One of them actually has already passed. The US should attempt to negotiate with Iran on its missile program and its destabilizing support for proxies in the region. I think we have to be honest and recognize that those efforts will probably fail in the current context of negotiations. But then the US should try to build an international uh, support effort to pressure Iran on these two concerns because they are indeed concerns to other countries as well. Obviously, US sanctions on Iran for its support for terrorism and human rights violations should continue, hopefully with broad international support. And it's important to note that in the original JCPOA agreement, those particular sanctions were not to be lifted. So that would not be a violation of our commitment to the JCPOA. Finally, the US should utilize its soft power to enhance its influence in the region. The US has enormous assets that bolster our influence from our economic strengths to cultural diplomacy. The region's interaction with US businesses, universities, and medical centers rem remain significant sources of influence for the United States. And I would say that in spite of setbacks, the US is still seen as a country of opportunities, rights, and laws that the people in the region wish for themselves. Our relationships with Gulf allies has not been and should not be now about security alone. Well, there is never a simple answer to what US policy in the Middle East should be. Administration after administrations have voiced the, ter the determination to be less engaged. And time after time, regional developments force those administrations back into the Middle East cauldron. We may want to reduce our commitment, but we do still have important national interests in the region. Those interests are likely to be challenged in the future as they have been in the past. We will be best ready to respond to those challenges if we have restored our credibility and our relationships with our closest regional allies. Thank you very much for your attention this evening. Now, as I said earlier, I'm very happy to take questions. If you would submit those questions uh, in chat. Uh, I am inviting my assistant, Tyler Malcolm, uh, to read those questions and I will respond and we'll take as many as we possibly can in the time we have left uh, for tonight's uh, event. Okay, yeah. So um, for the first question, um, it's a student question. Um, it's focusing on the maritime tensions, uh, most recently between Israel and Iran, on top of the other tensions between them, as well as the uh, recent accusations about an attack on the Iranian nuclear facility. Um, and the question is, what does that mean for U.S. policy in the region, and what does it mean for the JCPOA negotiations? Good question, and a complicated question to answer. Um, first, let me start by saying that when I first learned of what I'm going to say, point blank, or Iranian attacks on these ships, the picture that you saw was one of them, um, I immediately assumed that it was Iran alone uh, trying to assert its um, its uh, ability to do these things, to show that it was in fact a real threat uh, 
uh, to the Arab, our Arab allies and they should take note of that. But subsequent to those attacks, we've learned through, um, through Israeli sources that Israel has in fact been attacking Iranian owned vessels for some time. In fact, in some reasonably large numbers, I think I've seen the number 11, though that could be wrong. And what that means is that the Iranian attacks, and there, was, there were two recently on Israeli owned ships, uh, is, is somewhat in, more in retaliation to what they are uh, uh, receiving uh, than ne necessarily something that they initiated. I, I don't know who went first on this, but the whole uh, effort um, is certainly complicating the security situation in the Gulf because it does impact on the flow of oil uh, and it does impact on the security of our Arab Gulf states. I would just remind everyone that Israel has made it very, very clear uh, its opposition to Iran, not just to the nuclear uh, JCPOA, which they do, but also to the Iranian presence in Syria and their support for Hezbollah through Syria. And the, Syri the Israelis, who for most of the past never admitted publicly to their military actions in Syria or Lebanon for that matter, uh, actually in the last year have made it very clear when there were attacks on these sites that it was Israelis and it was against this Iranian presence and its support for Hezbollah. So, there has been a history of, of, of Israeli actions uh, toward Iran. Uh, and now what we see uh, is this um, incident in Natanz uh, where only the day before it, the president of Iran had inaugurated the use of the more advanced centrifuges. Uh, and certainly in some way, and we're not exactly sure yet, at least I'm not, uh, exactly how it was done, but it certainly destroyed the electrical system that supplied energy to the centrifuges. And while the Iranians say it, it didn't cause much damage or whatever, uh, those American experts who do know about centrifuges say that when you have them spinning at the speed that they have to spin and they lose power, there is usually going to be significant damage in the centrifuge interior. Uh, now, uh, that's sort of what we know about it at this point in time. And uh, we do know from some sources in Israel that imply that they were behind it. The United States has been adamant in saying uh, publicly in more than one occasion that we did not, we were not party to it. Uh, and also that we did not have any foreknowledge of it. Therefore, by uh, derivative, uh, we didn't agree to it or didn't uh, approve it. Sorry, approve it is the better word. So what is the impact of this? Well, you know, it could go uh, either way. Certainly the biggest concern uh, by our European allies and, and those who want to see the negotiations in Vienna go forward uh, after the first round, which both sides expressed uh, fairly optimistic uh, expressions about how those went, uh, that somehow the Iranians might use as an excuse not to continue those talks. I don't see any indication of that uh, yet, uh, except that there were the, the more hardliners in, um, in Iran did call on the government to withdraw from all the talks. Why would you talk with someone who's attacking us? That was on an assumption by that group that it was the United States or somehow involved. But we have not seen that. Uh, and uh, I think that they will continue those uh, talks. Uh, one could argue that they are in a weaker position because they aren't now able to, to increase production as they had anticipated, which was purportedly a way of putting pressure on the United States. On the other hand, um, they, it may be more um, uh, a pressure because of the need to avoid more of these kinds of incidents that might in fact destabilize the region. Um, I, I think that the talks, as I said, in, in Vienna will go on and uh, hopefully with a, a productive outcome. Okay, and um, our next question, I'm gonna collect a few that are all centered around the same topic and that is the Abraham Accords. 
our listeners want to know how you think the uh, new Israeli Arab relations will affect intergulf relations uh, within the GCC and are also wondering uh, what the prospects are for countries like Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar to also normalize ties with Israel. Well, as I said in my remarks, this is a major development and a, a very good one, a very uh, significant one and a good one. Um, the When we look at the other GCC states, uh, the one I would begin with is Saudi Arabia. I talked a bit about that. I think it's very clear from things that have come out that the crown prince of Saudi Arabia was at least amenable and may still be uh, toward um, uh, improved relations with Israel, whether it's full diplomatic relations or something a little bit less than that. But it is also clear that uh, King Salman, who is from the old school, uh, that believes that Israel, until it does something on behalf of the Palestinians, uh, that Saudi Arabia, he will object to Saudi Arabia having any sort of formal relations. That being said, of course, the Saudis have uh, taken some actions that indicate their acceptance or acquiescence of Israel in the region, uh, overflights, uh, for example. Uh, the Saudis did agree, first of all, to allow Air India of its flights from India to Tel Aviv to overfly. But then once there were diplomatic relations between Israel and the UAE, the both Israeli uh, aircraft, El Al, and UAE aircraft uh, up fly now over Saudi Arabia. So there is a, a clearly, a softening of the kind of, of, of uh, actions that we have historically seen. But now what about the other states? Well, I'll begin with Kuwait, which I know so well. Uh, Kuwait has a very unique internal political situation in which there are fundamentalists in the parliament, vocal fundamentalists in the parliament. And there has always been a sense uh, of support uh, toward the Palestinian cause it was certainly marred a lot by the Palestinian position on Iraqi invasion, but that was now 30 years ago. Uh, Sheikh Sabah, who died recently, uh, was uh, strong in, in supporting efforts for the Palestinians. I don't think the Kuwaitis will agree to any sort of normalization until there is a, a peace process uh, that's not only in play, but actually produces a, a Palestinian entity. Uh, now, for Qatar, Qatar is a bit more complicated. It's not going to want to be seen as following uh, the UAE's uh, footsteps um, like a little puppy dog. Uh, I, I, they've also uh, certainly supported uh, the fundamentalist uh, Muslim Brotherhood exiles from other countries, uh, both uh, from Egypt uh, initially, but also some from the UAE. Uh, so there is an, an, an element of of uh, religious fundamentalism at play there, which I think will probably keep them from following a uh, suit. Uh, Oman is definitely a, a potential uh, country that would, could join in. Uh, Oman is a unique country, as any one of you who know Oman. They have been far more moderate over the years on these sorts of issues. They did not break relations with Egypt when it established diplomatic ties with Israel. When we were at a point in which uh, the Madrid talks had produced some efforts uh, to have some joint non-political efforts between regional states and Israel, Oman hosted a, an institute for looking into desalinization research with Israeli researchers uh, in Oman. Um, they actually uh, had a visit uh, by Israeli leaders. Uh, so they are certainly amenable to a, at least a working relationship with Israel. Uh, whether the new Sultan would take the action to go to full diplomatic relations, I think it's possible. Uh, I think it's a matter of timing. And I'm not sure I can describe what that timing is likely to be. Okay, a, a few people have asked questions about um perceptions of U.S. withdrawal from the region, um, and specifically uh, with some of you know, the domestic concerns you mentioned, but also um, China, climate change. Basically asking, um, 
do we need to reaffirm reaffirm our intentions if we're just going to be shifting our priority away, pivoting to Asia, um, you know, whatever the policy is going to be called? Um, how do you think about that? Well, I I am reminded that, that different administrations, from Obama through Trump to now Biden, um, but have certainly tried to make it clear to our Arab Gulf allies that just because we had to focus on the Asia Pacific region did not mean that we were less concerned about the situation in the Gulf. And they all pointed out to the continued presence of a significant military force in the region, and I've described it. Uh, you know, I think there's very good argument, frankly, in pragmatic terms for reducing the number of US forces that we have in that region. Uh, if, if anything, uh, the US has demonstrated to our uh, Gulf allies that we have a global capability. I mean, look, twice uh, is my recollection, it could have been more time, but at least twice, the Trump administration flew B-52s from the West Coast of the United States uh, all the way over the Persian Gulf, um, deliberately signaling to Iran that we might not have B-52s in the region, but we can get them there pretty quickly. So I, I think we will maintain a naval presence of significance. I think we will continue to maintain the Central Command headquarters with sufficient forces in Kuwait as well, uh, and that these numbers will be sufficient to provide security for our allies and to remind Iran that they do have to deal with us in the Gulf, even though they wish we'd go, um, and that we have the capability of getting back in there with sufficient forces rather quickly. The problem is that Gulf leaders don't believe us. I can't tell you how many times I've traveled in the Gulf, how many times I have sat down with very well educated, very well understanding uh, people about global politics and international relations and the United States in particular, who still are concerned that what lies behind our various comments like pivoting to Asia means that we are um, minimizing or diluting our commitment in the Gulf. And I will convince them by arguments. And then as soon as I finish talking, they seem to be like a rubber band, it goes right back to where we were to start with. So I'm not sure what we can do to convince them except close consultations, diplomatic relations on a regular basis make a huge difference. Not surprising them about actions, explaining them before they take place, before they become public, something that the Trump administration did nothing about. Um, is, is very important in the reassurance to our allies about our commitment to them. The next question is about Yemen. Um, wondering whether Iran would be willing to play a helpful role in resolving the Yemen conflict um, if it were tied to uh, um, the atmosphere around the JCPOA issue or whether it's um, you know too valuable as a you know, site of proxy warfare for them. Yeah, I didn't talk a lot about Yemen, just simply out of a matter of timing. Um, but my own feeling is that the Iranians would probably not be active in trying to bring about a resolution of the issue there, because they do see benefit and not costing them very much. But there's another element at play here, which is important. I don't think the Houthis are puppets. Uh, I don't think any Yemeni is a puppet of any country. I learned a long time ago from posted there that there was an old saying, you can rent a Yemeni, but you can never buy him. Um, and so the reason what I'm talking about now is that the Houthis have equities in the fighting coming to an end for the ports and airports to be open for the attacks on their controlled area to end. Um, and what that means is a political settlement uh, that does, in effect, I think, recognize that the Houthis are there to stay. Uh, and then you have to deal with the separatist movement in the South and this so-called internationally recognized government, which frankly has very little credibility today. Um, the Saudis, I think, 
very much want to get out of the quagmire that they went into. And I think the international community is, is driven to try and bring about an end to this disastrous humanitarian situation. So there might well be enough interest by other parties, ex not including Iran, but including some of, of the Yemeni parties like the Houthis, to go ahead and try and find a solution. And I do not believe that the Iranians would be able to stop that. So it's my hope that an international effort and a, 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 a re-engaged effort on the part of the United States can actually move us in that direction. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, right. And this one actually comes from um, Nathan Brown, who you know well. Um, My next door neighbor, or used to be, then he moved away. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, he said that um, uncertainty and change has been a constant theme in your annual lecture. I can't remember any time you focused on US domestic politics as the source of uncertainty and instability. Um, you explored the implications for societies in the Gulf, uh, but as an educator in a school of international affairs, what advice would you give to an aspiring professional seeking a career serving a country whose domestic politics is so uncertain? Well, good question. And I think that uh, all of us who've been engaged in the Middle East uh, over the decades know that uh, U.S. domestic uh, politics or poli uh, situation has always had an impact on our policies. In fact, again, one of those uh, often overused statements is that American foreign policy is always do domestically, politically driven, uh, more than uh, clearly understanding what's going on abroad. But that being said, uh, we've always had uh, a congressional interest in these issues, such as human rights, arms sales, um, narcotics, uh, engagement of, of certain uh, parties, and of course, terrorism, uh, that's gonna continue. But it is up to the administration and through the administration to attempt to educate the American public about our interest and what we need to be doing and to bring about the support that is needed domestically for our policies. When we haven't done that, we've lost the, the public support and our policies have collapsed, have not worked. Uh, our, our actions have usually produced, have been counterproductive, let me put it that way. So what would I say to most people? I would say today, there's a great opportunity for those who want to go into international affairs uh, to the foreign service specifically, but other issues, because I think there is now a renewed openness on the part of our government uh, in the White House, particularly in the administration, to being engaged, to not be unilateral, uh, not to be uh, dominating, but to be in a cooperative uh, arrangement. So we're gonna be working to improve our relationships and we're gonna need good people in the diplomatic corps. Hopefully we will never ever again go through what we did in the Trump administration where so many positions in the region were left open for so long. Now, uh, I had a student remind me this morning that it wasn't just that Trump didn't nominate, it was also trouble getting nominees through uh, the Senate. But that being said, uh, the United States, the, the Trump administration did not name an ambassador to Jordan for almost three years. There weren't, there wasn't an ambassador in Turkey uh, or uh, when we had the problems with them on the Turkish border. I could go on and on. Anyway, th to make a point is that's going to change. Uh, this administration has made it clear. It's going to fill the positions, make the nominations. And so diplomacy and dialogue uh, in the region will improve. And I hope will be a significant factor in helping to restore our credibility. So I guess we're out of time. I want to thank all of you for being with us this evening. Uh, for joining us. I know that this um, has been recorded and will in due course be posted uh, and will be available to those of you who would like to pass it on to other people. Um, again, thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that I said to my class earlier today, and I said at the beginning of my lecture, the situation in the region is always changing. And about the best thing we can do is try to understand what's behind it so we can figure out maybe where it's going. Thank you all very, very much and have a nice evening.